The first talk of the afternoon will be uh, given by Larry Katz Nelson, entitled Managing Your Symptoms, Clinical Syndromes, and the Drugs to Treat Them. I have to tell you at least a little bit of a funny story. Larry, oh no, you can get over here. Yeah. I, I, hadn't, uh, I had met Larry, and I was uh, in my office, and I got three or four emails from this guy asking me about research for neuroendocrine tumors. And I'm thinking, well, why does he want to, you know, who's this guy, and why does he want to do research with me? And so we're talking, and we're, and we're exchanging emails. And, and then I said, well, yeah, we, we could meet sometime. Do you ever come to Stanford? And he says, well, every day. <laughs> <laughs> he was hired by neurosurgery, which is why I didn't know him. And he was hired as, by neurosurgery to be a neuroendocrinologist. His office was three doors down from mine. <laughs> but he just comes, so it wasn't that surprising. So, so uh, Larry is a card-carrying neuroendocrinologist. And if you have neuroendocrine tumors, that's kind of the uh, apropos. Uh, and, and how many neuroendocrinologists would you say are in the country? In this <laughs> like neuron consumers, he's one in a million. So go ahead, Larry. Thank you, George, for the for the story, and um, for inviting me and Lauren and the rest of the foundation for doing so. Pleasure to be here. So I am an endocrinologist. Uh, I, that's where my training is. My interests are in tumors of the endocrine system, including carcinoid neuroendocrine tumors. So I'm very happy to speak with you today. Now, my topic that I was asked to review was kind of the management of the clinical symptoms from my standpoint. And I'll be discussing not only carcinoid tumors, but one of the syndromes associated with carcinoid tumors, Cushing syndrome, which some of you patients may have. I must say the, the uh, talk I just heard by the dietitian was excellent. And there is some overlap. I won't be trying to cover what she covered, but referring to some of that, too. It was really a superb uh, review. So. What are the carcinoid symptoms? You've been hearing about this through the day and probably a lot before today. And I'll be reviewing some of these with regard to what we recommend to how to manage these, from, at least from my standpoint. So the main one is the flushing. Many of you are familiar with this. And this can be quite a problem, uh, depending on the frequency, uh, duration, and intensity. But this is one of the, one of the main, main syndromes, uh, symptoms associated with carcinoid. Diarrhea is another one, which is a big problem, particularly with regard to what you heard before, but nutritional uh, syndrome associated with this, such as niacin deficiency. We'll be covering some of these, and just the fact that this is a major uh, problem affecting someone's life if they have frequent bowel movements for the day. Just very difficult. The bronchoconstriction, which is basically asthma, which is mainly seen in patients who have the bronchial carcinoids, the tumors up in the lung. Valvular heart disease, you'll be hearing more about uh, from one of my colleagues, Randy Vagelos, in the next uh, session. Fatigue, low blood pressure can certainly be seen because these tumors produce factors that can lower blood pressure. And then I'll be telling you a little bit about Cushing syndrome. I was asked to review that as well, which is one of the other kind of more systemic syndromes associated with carcinoid tumors. Now, you've heard a lot about uh, what to do in terms of self-management. Uh, you've heard from the dietitian again, that was an excellent talk on factors to look for. I'm covering these again. But the tricks are difficult, and they are unique and individualized. And sometimes you just have to experiment and find out what works <laughs> for you. In general, you may have heard before, that the key thing is to avoid the precipitating factors. Now, these can be variable and unique and can change over time, but these are the, th these are the things we need to look out for. The other things I'm going to be discussing will be symptomatic control, particularly of the flushing and the diarrhea. I'll be discussing endocrine management of these tumors, particularly with regard to the somatostatin analog, sandostatin, which is available in the United States uh, for this tumor. I will not be referring to chemotherapy or surgery. You'll be hearing that or have heard about that already from my colleagues at Stanford. And yes, I am there, George. <laughs> so management of the symptoms. The, as many of you know, the syndrome of carcinoid syndrome can be provoked by various uh, stressors. It can be emotional. It can be physical. There are some people who notice when they exercise, and that's debilitating because we all want exercise, and some people find there's certain exercises that bring this out. Infections certainly can, as can certain foods, which I'll be getting into. 
So as best we can, the easy thing to say is avoid precipitating factors, but it may not be so easy. And sometimes we have to try to, try to eliminate one aspect of foods or part of our uh, lives to figure out what exactly is that factor which is provoking the carcinoid uh, crisis. The foods are unfortunately many that can cause, uh, at least provoke, the carcinoid syndrome, particularly the flushing and the diarrhea. You heard a lot about these from uh, uh, the dietitian, who was great. Alcohol, unfortunately, is one of the uh, provoking factors. Um, and many of the, the, the cheeses, which I would, Kevin Barrett and Stilton, which I wouldn't eat anyway, but nevertheless, uh, is, uh, these, are, these are the types of cheeses that contain the tyramine and dopamine, the amines you heard about before, which can, in people, and some people, cause a crisis. The uh, other ones include, include the uh, soybeans. In fact, there are some people who recommend no tofu products because this is very high in these contents and can provoke a crisis. But then again, some people find that they can eat tofu. So it, it's very individualized. Caffeine can do this as well, and there, uh, and, but sometimes it is a concentration amount, meaning how much coffee someone drinks. It may be that one cup is fine, but two or three cups provokes a crisis. So that's something that someone has to find out by experimentation. The pizzas are sometimes tricky, and I have conversations with patients about the pizzas because it's variable which pizza will set this off. And there was some time that people said it was pepperoni pizza, and then people have did research and found that pepperoni wasn't so bad after all, I guess depending where you get the pepperoni. And then it was found that maybe more of the commercially available pizzas are okay, but it's more of the kind of unique gourmet pizzas that may carry more of these tyramines that may provoke a crisis. So it's, it's variable. In general, the pizzas that one gets from these big chains of pizza, uh, pizza places, whether in Safeway or in um, restaurants, are probably okay. It's, it tends to be individualized more of these gourmet pizzas. And there are studies where people take different pizzas and they crunch them up and they look for tiramisu content. And, and it turns out, again, it is some more of the gourmet pizzas and some pepperonis, I'm told. So now, You've heard about this, and that's I, I referred to some of these provoking factors to look out for, and I thought, again, the dietitian did a terrific uh, uh, review of that. But what are some of the other things from a medical standpoint we can recommend to try to slow down the diarrhea? You heard about um, using some kind of stool binders, particularly in people who've had pancreatic surgery. I will not be referring to those here, but those are certainly of value in patients who've had surgery like that. But the other ones are kind of more nonspecific diarrhea treatment for starters, and that includes, many of you may have seen these, using small doses of opiates like codeine or tincture of opium, which are very good at limiting a peristalsis, at minimizing the diarrhea. The problem with these drugs is that they can cause fatigue and have side effects. But um, fatigue, maybe some confusion, some nausea. But in general, they're well tolerated. And people who have significant diarrhea or having a crisis, it may be something very much you want to consider, having some coating around or tincture of opium around the house for if something like this happens or is a crisis and there's significant diarrhea, this can do a long way to, uh, to try to limit the amount of diarrhea. Imodium, many of you are familiar with. Uh, uh, we give to our kids, or maybe we're not supposed to give our kids, but when they're having diarrhea. But it's a terrific uh, medication at, at trying to limit uh, the diarrhea. And there's also another medicine which I have not used a lot, but many of my colleagues have found to be very helpful, uh, a serotonin antagonist, a ciproheptadine, which has been useful also, can cause fatigue as well. But these are all medicines. Their goal is to try to limit the diarrhea, limit the colonic motility, and try to reduce the diarrhea. But these are nonspecific agents. You use these uh, for any type of diarrhea that you're trying to limit uh, the amount of diarrhea. So what are the more targeted medical therapy? And the ones that we use is virtually one drug that's available in the United States right now, and that's called sandostatin. Now, just a bit of what this is, sandostatin is an analog of a medicine, of, of a hormone called uh, somatostatin. And somatostatin is not shown in the slide. Somatostatin is this hormone that's ubiquitous. It's all over the body. And it plays a major role in many, many processes of the body, one of them being gut motility. And it turns out that uh, in patients who have diarrhea syndromes, uh, including carcinoid, or some patients who have HIV disorders can have diarrhea syndromes, sandostatin, the somatostatin type analog, is very useful at slowing down that motility. It's a very, very good drug like that. Natural somatostatin only lasts in the blood if I inject it for about a couple minutes. That's not very useful from a medical standpoint, but this medication can last many hours, if not 
30 days or so, which we'll discuss. So it's a very, very good drug. Uh, and it works in the majority of people, uh, if many of you I'm sure have seen this, at limiting the gut motility. It comes in different flavors. It comes as a, a sandostatin subcutaneous injection, and when this is given, it's given as a shot. It's a very small amount, but it's in, like, usually in the stomach wall, given every six to eight hours. It's very effective. It's usually gone after about six hours, so you have to keep giving shots of this. And before the long-acting depot preparations are available, this is all we had. And it's very good. The good about these injections, one, is that it's cheaper than the long-acting variety. And in patients where there's insurance issues, and this is not minor, it's significantly cheaper, and it may be recommended as preferable. The second thing about it is that you can reach higher levels in the blood than you can with the long-acting preparations. So some people, the long-acting preparations aren't effective, and we need to use these subcutaneous injections. These can be given at home. They're fairly simple to give, but you do have to draw up the sample and then give the injection yourself. But it's very, very, very useful uh, for patients. The LAR, Samostatin LAR, LAR stands for long-acting release. This lasts in the blood. This is taking the same Samostatin but it's in a formulation that when it's given in uh, the rear end, in the muscle, in the buttocks, that it can last anywhere from about 21 days to about 60 days. So it lasts a long period of time. So it's a depot, long-acting formulation. Terrific medication. Uh, the benefit of this is you only have to take one shot every three to four weeks. The uh, downside of it is you've got to come in and get a shot because it's usually given by healthcare provider. It's not simple to give. You really need nurses who are accustomed and are trained in giving this because it's easy to clog up. I've tried giving it once and it, it splattered out and, and that was $3,000 right in my hands and, and it's, it's not the simplest thing to do. So you it's, it can't really give it yourselves very easily. So you really need to come in to have the medication given to an infusion unit or to medical office. So that's the downside of it. The other potential downside is the fact that, you can, as I said earlier, you cannot really achieve the same levels. In some people it works great, but other people it's just not effective enough, and we have to go back to the injectable therapy. We can get higher peaks for the day. Side effects of these medications, because I just told you it's very, very effective at limiting the diarrhea. We use these in almost everybody who has a carcinoid tumor with associated diarrhea. Very, very effective at limiting diarrhea. But there are some side effects, and some people actually causes diarrhea. It can make it worse. It may have an almost a paradoxical effect on the gut motility. And I use it for another, another disorder called acromegaly, which is due to a pituitary tumor. And in patients who have this, we give the shots, and it actually causes diarrhea for a few days after each shot. So in some people, it has the opposite effect, and that can be limiting. But for most people, it doesn't do that. It's, it just it limits the diarrhea. But it can cause bloating, and that usually happens within the first 48 to 72 hours after an injection. So that may be somewhat problematic, depending on how bad that is, because it makes the whole gut stop, and then it kind of gets, it distends, the belly distends for a couple days. Gallstones may happen with this as well. These are usually asymptomatic. When we used to give this drug, we would do gallbladder ultrasounds at baseline in every two or three months, which was pain in the neck for people to do this. And we found that even if we picked up gallstones, we weren't doing anything about them anyway, because it was pretty unusual that it became symptomatic. So the way they're managed now is we don't bother doing the gallbladder ultrasounds. Uh, what we do is just wait for someone to say, my stomach hurts. And because it's so unusual that these become actually that block the gallbladder and cause a, a hot, what we call a hot gallbladder or an obstructed gallbladder, cholecystitis, that needs to be removed. So we generally don't follow for that. More uncommon side effects can include hair loss, some people get dizzy. The sugar problems, hyperglycemia, can be somewhat of an issue. Uh, and, uh, and what happens is this medication, or I should say natural somatostatin, which is what this is like, affects how much insulin the pancreas makes. And so this drug can affect how much insulin the pancreas makes as well and can reduce the amount of insulin. And when that happens, our sugar levels go up because the main purpose of insulin is to keep sugar down. So if sugar levels go up, some patients, particularly those who already have diabetes or a tendency towards diabetes, the diabetes can get more out of control. And this is found. So we do monitor glucose levels in people who, have, uh, who are taking this medication. Um, that's a very interesting... Uh, Ringer. The, uh, um, and so that's something we need to monitor. 
The, ex the exact opposite may happen. Rarely, that sugar levels actually become low. There's another hormone that affects how much glucose is produced. That's called glucagon, and that can be affected as well. The bottom line is that uncommonly with this disorder, when we start the sandostatin, patients may have worsening of the diabetes. And so if someone has diabetes, we're very careful about telling them to keep monitoring their sugars and to tell us that the glucose levels have gone up because we will be probably changing their, their uh, management for the diabetes. Just tell you about some other medications. Uh, one is lanreotide. Lanreotide is, is very, very similar, if not almost synonymous, to arctreotide. Lanreotide is used for other types of neuroendocrine tumors, such as tumors of the pituitary gland, the disorder called acromegaly I told you about. Lanreotide is approved in Europe and other countries for the treatment of carcinoid syndrome, not yet in the United States. It's currently being studied for use in the United States. Basically, as far as I'm concerned, it's the same kind of drug. It's administered the same time intervals. It has similar efficacy profiles, at least with other tumors, meaning that it works very similarly. Uh, the difference is it's given, a, the administration itself is a little different. It's given as a shot that into the rear end as well, doesn't go quite as deep, doesn't go in the muscle. It goes into the, the soft tissues. It goes into the, uh, the fat. Uh, so people say it's, it's, it's different. But in truth, the needle size is big enough that it's about the same. So, uh, and, and, and the, the, one of the differences that people say they can give it at home, and I know people that have given it at home, uh, which is Samostatin LER you really can't do, but with this medication apparently some people can because it doesn't have to go as deep so people can do it. Uh, in its simple form, people sit on a chair, they let the one side drift off the chair, and they just plug in right there. And that's how it's, it, it has been given apparently successfully. It's not available here in this country. Again, it's being studied. And there's another, there's another drug, Pasiriotide, which uh, uh, we've worked on uh, with, with George Fisher. And this, this is a medication which is very similar to Stanostatin, made by the same company, by Novartis Pharmaceuticals. And Pasiriotide, also called SOM-230 for somatostatin, is a medication which may be blanketing more of the possible receptors, these, these catcher mitts, which can catch somatostatin. So it may be, it's thought to be a little more effective. We've looked at it in patients who had refractory disorder, carcinoid to arctreotide, meaning that the arctreotide wasn't working as well. And we gave pasiriotide in a research protocol and it appeared to be effective, at least in these patients who were on the study. And those data are currently uh, being an, analyzed, but this may be one of the potential drugs of the future. Whether it will be given before sandostatin is not quite so clear. Probably not, but it may very well be something we can consider, at least if, if sandostatin becomes less effective. But again, that's not where cl there's no close. We're not close to uh, um, FDA approval for that drug. Five-minute five warning. Perfect. So the. Um, uh, so Cushing syndrome, just to uh, say what this is very briefly, Cushing syndrome is a disorder where people have too much steroids in their body. And you may have seen people who have taken too much prednisone or not taking too much or taking prednisone for arthritis, for asthma, where their face gets red and beefy uh, and the body fat changes, so they get a lot of fat in the central area. And this can be because of, this, of, of too much steroids in the blood. And this can happen in patients who have carcinoid tumors because carcinoid tumors can produce these factors which travel to the adrenal glands, and it's the adrenal glands, it's right above the kidneys, that say make all this cortisol. And it can change the body. Here's an example of what it can do. Here's a, this is the same woman. Uh, before, uh, her, before is when she had the Cushing syndrome and where you see the, 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 the full red face on your right. And here she is after when the tumor was removed, when she no longer had the Cushing syndrome. But it, it, it causes the, the central fat accumulation. And this is one of the problems that can very rarely be seen in patients who have, who have carcinoid tumors. It can cause a number of other associated problems, including bone loss, so patients are at risk for osteoporosis and bone fractures. It can also cause hypertension and diabetes. So it's a systemic disorder. It can affect many aspects of the body when this happens. And we need to look for this. We very much need to look for this. And I could say also, it tends to happen more commonly with bronchial carcinoids uh, and with neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. The treatment of this is, is similar to the treatment for all the other aspects of carcinoid syndrome, meaning that the main target of therapy is to treat the tumor itself, either surgically resect or use sandostatin or use other medications that we can block down the adrenal glands. I'm happy to discuss those if there's time. Uh, 
rarely we do surgery in the adrenal glands to treat this problem, just by removing all sources of cortisol. So I want to thank you again for inviting me, and it was my pleasure very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, for a patient that has elevated gastrin hormone levels, what are the ways that you can manage those levels? Okay. So uh, elevation in gastrin, um, gastrin is this hormone that controls uh, acid secretion in the stomach. That's what gastrin does. And when gastrin levels are elevated, it can mean one of several things. There could be uh, it could be uh, associated as a side effect of just having low acid in the stomach. There's various disorders that can do this. So that means it's not a disorder as much as it's just what happens when the body doesn't make acid. And that can happen with syndromes called pernicious anemia. There's various kinds that can. It can also be uh, uh, elevated in patients. Many of you who are taking uh, medications uh, 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 to treat stomach disorders may have, or take various medications, like protonics, for example, that can raise blood levels of gastrin, and people think there's a gastrin problem when it's measured, but really it's just it's, it's an artifact of having taken these medications. Rarely, it can be a secondary to a tumor, a neuroendocrine tumor, like a carcinoid tumor, that's producing this, called a gastrinoma. And these tumors, which are in the pancreas as well, can cause, can produce too much gastrin, and that can it cause excess acid secretion in the stomach, and that can cause ulcers and diarrhea. So whenever we see a patient that has a high gastrin level, it's, it's, it's important for us to figure out, A, is this the primary problem? Is this a tumor underlying that we need to watch for? Then anybody's got a neuroendocrine process, tumor process? Or is this just an artifact of there's some other problem in the stomach or an artifact of someone being on a, a common medication which treats acid in the stomach? And that's what the, uh, what's important for us. For a patient that might develop shingles from chemotherapy, is there anything you can suggest to manage nerve pain? I'm going to leave that one to George. Well, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, there's, there's topical lidocaine, which can sometimes help for the local pain associated with shingles. There's pain medications. Fortunately, the pain medication, the pain usually improves, but it can sometimes be very severe, and that's called post herpetic neuralgia, and that pain can be uh, uh, strikingly uncomfortable, but slowly improves with time. So simple things like Vicodin and narcotics are sometimes used, but these, these new lid lidocaine patches that can go over that area are sometimes helpful too. For patients whose carcinoid syndrome is not well controlled by the monthly sandostatin LAR injections, what, what other options exist? Ah, thank you. So in sandostatin, uh, this may happen, that the sandostatin becomes, uh, the patient becomes refractory to the sandostatin. There are several options we have at that point. One is we try to change the, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 right, the, do the dosing, where we will, make, we will change the sandostatin to more frequent dosing, We'll try, and instead of every 28 days or one month, we move it to every three, month, three weeks. We try that, and sometimes that will result in higher blood levels. We try to increase the dose. We can go up on the dose, even beyond what is sometimes recommended as a dose. We do that. For example, we go to 40 milligrams, sometimes 50 milligrams, and every three weeks sometimes we, that is effective in some patients. I have found sometimes we switch to the subcutaneous shots using those three or four times a day. That becomes more of a hindrance on someone's quality of life there. But sometimes that is more effective. In the future, uh, this other medication I was telling you about, Pasiritai, may be effective in someone like this. This is somewhere it's being developed right now. So there may be other medical uh, formulations that be available just for this one issue. Great. And finally, for, uh, for a patient with a non-functioning tumor that might be on a sandostatin um, or another octreotide analog, could that treatment cause a non-functioning carcinoid to become functioning, or could it cause any other, any other problems for the patient? It, so the, the question is, if we're using this medication, the somatostatin analog medication like sandostatin, for the treatment of a neuroendocrine tumor that's non-functioning, so it's not secreting any hormones that are affecting the body, it's not causing the high gastrin levels, it's not causing the carcinoid crisis, then the, this medicine won't cause any other syndromes, it won't provoke uh, any other hormone factors would be produced by these tumors. The only things we'd be consider about, considering would be the side effect profile I talked to you about. We still monitor the glucose values. We'd still be following uh, um, symptoms of gallstone disease. But it wouldn't be causing any other form of neuroendocrine tumor syndrome. I, I, I've had uh, a couple people over the years refer to me who were on octreotide for presumed carcinoid syndrome. 
uh, with diarrhea. And after inquiring a little bit closer, they had very fatty diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And in fact, their fatty diarrhea was probably due to the octreotide shutting down the pancreas release of pancreatic enzymes, which then prohibit you from digesting fat. And so it's actually the octreotide that was ultimately causing the diarrhea. You give those people pancreas enzymes, and they don't. Yeah, it goes away. It's interesting. So we were seeing more of the malabsorption with octreotide when, when it was given as injections uh, multiple times a day. And that has something to do maybe with the fact that when you give this as multiple injections, you get high peaks down, mm -hmm. high peaks down. And there were a number of patients, quite a bit, uh, who were having chronic diarrhea with this and were malabsorbing, having fatty stools. And you could do, you can measure blood markers of malabsorption and see this. And so we were doing that pretty routinely, actually, with the shots. Um, it's been reported that can happen with the Sanostatin long-acting depot yeah. formulations, and yes, it does cause diarrhea. My experience has been it's, it's usually very temporary. I haven't seen for many years that experience with this, and and that's fortunate. Um, so, but it, it, it and some people it can slow down the gut to the extent or change the motility to such an extent that it can cause malabsorption. But again, we haven't seen that with these formulations. At least I haven't for many years. Can, can patients develop um, a tolerance to octreotide or a dependence on it, whereas if they go on, they can't come off? Well, usually, well, it depends what the indication is for its use. If someone is starting octreotide for uh, diarrhea, then, and if the diarrhea is better, people usually don't want to come off. So it's, uh, once you say, can someone no longer come off, uh, it's not, um, it's not going to make the underlying tumor actually go away. That's the thing. So when people go on these medications, it's there for symptomatic relief. And in some people, it can prevent tumor growth, but uh, usually it's there for the symptomatic relief. So patients usually don't want to go off. Um, what was the other part of your? The Tolerance. Tolerance. Yeah. And so... It is true that patients who are on this, it can become ineffective at times. We are talking about that a minute ago, that there are times where we have to increase the dose of Sanostatin. That was a previous question. And we may have to go up on the dose because we are finding that people are having breakthrough diarrhea on the doses that we are using for the Sanostatin, at least the starting doses. So and that, by definition, is tolerance, that people need a higher dose to be effective. And so that is when we have to increase the dose, and that may happen, yes. Great. Thanks very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.